So T.S. Eliot, uh, maybe two of his, his two most famous poems, um, The Wasteland, as well as The Love Song of J. Alfred Proof Rock. I sent you guys a parody of J. Alfred Proof Rock right before class to your emails, too, about the kinds of parodies, the poem for our modern moment with like all of us sitting around bored because of this quarantine so check that out later if you want if you want to laugh it's, it's that kind of like good dry humor that i appreciate but yeah i'm gonna i'm just gonna pull up some notes that i made um for a previous class you know to sort of give you some talking points so, <clears throat> so yet again, we are talking about a new literary movement. Of course, uh, last couple of weeks, you know, we had uh, realism, we had um, with Flaubert, we had the Gothic sort of a gothic story with yellow wallpaper. But it's also a gothic story grounded in realism, too. Right? You know, what happened in the story came about as because of psychological reasons. It wasn't because there was a ghost sort of jumping out at you. <clears throat> but this latest movement that we have is called modernism. Any of you guys heard that term modernism? Maybe in like a intro to art class or something like that. Shane's saying, yeah, he's heard he's heard this. Yeah, so if it's pretty much the in literature, it pretty much works the exact same way as it does in in art. You know, it comes from the term modernity, and this term mostly, this form of literature mostly would was here from around 1915 to 1945, so right after the, right before the Second World War ended. There's really only one other sort of major movement that sprung up since modernism, and that's called postmodernism, which uh, I won't go into too much about that today. We'll probably get to that in the last day or two of class. Yeah, modernism is there. You know, is what's on this table for today. So the question is, what is modernism? <clears throat> so, so if you look at uh, if you look at this sort of this note I have here, modernism is very abstract. All right? These these guys and gals, you know, they pretty much came up with this idea that you know because of things that are happening in the world, the way that we told stories, the way that we wrote poems, they no longer can adequately represent, you know, our modern, our modern moment, right? These old epic poems, even realism, right? None, none of this stuff can really adequately represent the horrors that are that have started up in the twentieth century. Whenever we talk about the the horrors of the twentieth century, you know, the First World War, you know, caused a lot of sort of psychological breakdown, especially in Europe. Not as much so as in America, but in Europe especially, you know, the First World War caused a lot of you know, a lot of psychological consequences for all those nations. You know, whenever we talk about the First World War, you know, we talk about stuff like this was for the first time violence and war on such a massive scale, you know, that it was, that it defied all other wars before it. it so, for instance, one battle of the First World War, um, forget which battle it was but in one battle there was more people killed in one battle than in the entire american civil war and if that tells you anything about the sort of death and destruction that this war caused 
course, the, if you guys know your history, World War One was really just kind of sprang up out of nothing, right? Unlike the Second World War, World War One kind of came about for sort of ridiculous reasons. You know, you had the you had a German you had the German nation that was which was kind of expanding. You had the Russian nation which was going through the Bolshevik. Well, they went through the Bolshevik Revolution during the First World War. But it was just all these. It, the First World War was pretty much just a bunch of European countries getting into a pissing contest. That's pretty much all it was. You know, to uh, unlike World War Two, which had a lot more reasons for why it started but the thing about this war was the reason why there was such violence on a, such a massive scale you had these great sort of defensive weapons you know this was when the machine gun sort of the turret machine gun was first invented right you had um, at the time you really didn't have a lot of offensive weaponry Right, so tanks, for instance, were in their infancy as far as compared to what they would look like even 20 years later during the Second World War. So you had all these big defensive weapons. You know, you had the, both sides of the battle would sort of hole up in a trench. You know, that's where we have the term trench warfare, right? You know, the it was all these battles drug on and on and on sometimes for months and it's a great stalemate because not neither side could really advance to break the to break the stalemate because of all the defensive weaponry that they had they were pretty much they had these big machine guns and the sort of rifles that these soldiers carried were pretty much equivalent to like what a civil war rifle would look like if that one, if that tells you anything, so you can't really bust through a machine gun <clears throat> with its spread with an old Civil War rifle, right? It's just not, it's just not going to happen. So death on massive scale, hundreds of, th I think even millions died during this war. Let me see if I can get you a number. I think they say it in their book. Of course, um, I'm sure you guys have talked about World War One a lot, some in your history classes. Of course, World War Two always sort of gets the most attention as far as things like history class goes. World War One is often sort of skimmed over. Of course, you guys probably know that um, <clears throat> you know World War One also had very dramatic consequences for the world after. So once the First World War ended, you know, there was all this economic destruction in Europe. And of course, um, you know the nations that won, Britain and France, you know, and all those nations. You know, they enacted severe sort of economic consequences on Germany, right? Who was who was on the losing end. It drove Germany into this sort of extreme dep depression, economic depression in the twenties. Of course, that the sort of bitterness and ugliness that came about for people not having jobs. You know, they they that's helped bring about the Nazi movement, right? Because you had all these people without jobs. They wanted somebody to blame for their problems. So what, what did they do? They blamed, they blamed the Jews, right? So that the fact that the fact Germany's the Nazi movement in Germany probably would not have even came up had it not been for the allied nations punishing Germany to the point where people weren't working, 
or people were starving to death. The money, the German currency was so useless you know, that they were actually burning the money in the street. They were actually burning the money for, uh, for warmth and the winter. That's how worthless the German currency was. So, but it, it, this economic consequences happened in England and France too. All this economic destruction, they really didn't do much to, to fix it after. Can't really fix an economy like that overnight. Uh, America in the 1920s, you guys probably know, was kind of booming, right? They call it the Roaring Twenties in America, but it was it was booming. But it it wasn't because the economy was good. It was this sort. This was the time where the world where we started finally getting a world economy. So no longer are we in. Um, like the United States economy or the British economy or the German economy. This was the 20th, early 20th centuries where the whole world's economy started becoming interlinked together. So while the European Europe was sort of struggling with depression, America was sort of riding on a bubble, right? Almost, almost exactly like what just happened to us a month ago, right? We, we thought we were having a good economy. You know, but it was pretty much this bubble effect, right? As soon as one thing started happening, you know, the entire bubble sort of, sort of crashed. Of course, there's lots of reasons for why the American stock market finally went down in 1929. I'm not going to go into all of that, you know, but um, but it was a lot of it was linked to the fact that the whole world economy was very sick. Right, and we were kind of living on a false sort of bubble, bubble effect. The same thing happened in two thousand and eight. Right, the world economy wasn't doing too good. You know, a lot of a lot because of war, all the wars. You know, eventually, it all came crashing down. And so, unfortunately. You know, in our lifetimes, we've already went through two economic busts, 2008 and 2020. <clears throat> but all this stuff with World War I, the violence, you know, the, uh, the breakdown in economies, the breakdown in even civilized structure, you know, this helped lead to this literary movement called modernism. You know, we had around this time other thinkers who were springing up too. This was when Sigmund Freud was at his most, was at a sort of peak. So you guys know that Freud had the Oedipus complex idea, but he also came up with this idea called the death drive, right? Which is the, from the moment we're born, we're we're sort of we we have this sort of unconscious desire to seek our own death. All right, that's pretty much what the idea of the death drive is. He he came up with that idea after World War One. So we live in a world now, after starting around 1915, 1920, the whole world's changed, right? After World War One. We can't say anything is the same now. You know, compared to the eighteen hundreds. The world's nothing like it was even 20 years ago. That's where, they, that's where they're at. So how do you tell stories? How do you tell poetry? It's, it's now abstract. Like the old rules no longer apply. The story or subject doesn't matter as much now, as much as the work being art for art's sake. So this is, I don't know if you guys have heard that expression before, art for art's sake, but this, this helped, this came about during modernism, right? The, the book or poem no longer really even has to make sense, right? We don't have to even make meaning out of it because we now live in a world without meaning, right? So you know, this is the time where, where stories, poems, they started having sort of taking these abstract, almost even very symbolic structures, 
you know, it doesn't really make any any sense as far as what they're about. Or, of course, we're talking about poetry today, but when we talk about prose, you know, this is when stories started getting told through perspective, often through the perspective of an unreliable narrator. So we saw an unreliable narrator last time with the yellow wallpaper, right? That's kind of a story that sort of shows how this idea of the unreliable narrator was um, sort of growing before this even happened. But during the modernist movement, it's rare that you ever have a story told through the perspective of a narrator anymore, like Flaubeau's narrator, right? Flaubeau's narrator knows everything that's happening to the characters. He get the Flaubeau's narrator gives you a document, a documentary view of what's happening to Emma. Well, if you were writing this through a modernist perspective, you would probably be it would probably be told through the perspective of Emma and her thoughts and feelings and observations and smells and all of the senses that she has. You know, it is often told through, oftentimes writers like uh, William Faulkner told the stories through very unreliable ca characters, right? So maybe someone who is going through some sort of mental illness, right? He often told the stories through the, he told one story through the perspective of someone who is mentally, mentally, uh, you know, what, what lack of a better word retarded right he would talk, he would tell stories through those characters eyes so again it was hard it's often it's hard to make sense of what's happening we can we can do it but that's no longer really the point you know the point is that we're now making art for the sake of for the sake of making art you talk about if you talk about how this worked in the visual arts, you know somebody like uh, Picasso, right? Picasso is known as a modernist painter, right? You don't really, you don't really make too much sense as far as what's what Picasso is actually doing with his paintings, right? We just kind of admire the paintings for what they are, if that makes sense. You can debate all day about what they're about, but there's no definitive answers. Right. So I say here, modernist literature is written in fragments. And we'll see exactly how that works with the wasteland when we talk about it more in a second. Oftentimes, I told you guys that the old ways that we told stories are no longer relevant, right? Those are However, the modernists also felt a compulsion to always reference a lot of these classical stories, right? They all, they all like to show that they were a well-read bunch of, of intellectuals and individuals, especially T.S. Eliot. You know, I don't know if you guys read through the poem today. I told you guys last week it wouldn't make sense. Right? I, I prepared for that. Maybe you made some sense out of it. But you probably saw with all the footnotes on the bottom of their book, right, he's constantly referencing classical literature or even literature from other, from the East, Eastern world too. And they do that as sort of a, even though they, they want to show that they can break free from it, but they also don't want to, but they also want to show that they're still partaking in this sort of Western canon too yeah you know, I, I was kind of amazed today when i read through it because i've never i've taught this class several times but i've never taught the wasteland in this class before constant allusions to all the stuff we've read right hamlet's referenced paradise lost is referenced dante's referenced oedipus the king is referenced with the pope with the blind um prophet Tiresias. Right. All these references that we, even from stuff that we've read in this class, are are laced within this modernist poetry. So it's kind of contradictory, right? They want to break free from the past, but also they want to show how much they know about the past too. 
you know, with with modernism, before we get to Eliot, one last point. This is when, this is, the modernists were very much, I, I like modernism, I'm not going to lie. It's not, it's not what I specialize in. I'm a 19th, 1800s sort of guy. But modernism, the modernists were kind of snooty at the same time with the types of uh, literature that they wanted to write and the types of literature that they wanted to consume. So writers like T.S. Eliot, for instance, you know, they wanted to sort of paint themselves as being good literature. Right. This is this is good literature. It's hard to. This is when they came up with the idea that good literature sh should be hard to read. Right. Good literature should be uh, challenging. So they came up with this idea of high literature. Right. Challenging. Almost inaccessible. Right. They didn't want the average Joe on the average Joe on the streets not going to be reading the wasteland. Right, but they also but they made the distinction between them and what they called low literature, which was often popular literature, stuff that we talked about in Madame Bovary, right? Romance novels, adventures, um, you know, sort of something like Mark Twain, right? Huckleberry Finn. That would be a form of low literature for these for the modernists romance novels you know any anything that uh westerns westerns that were often uh, western genre was invented came about at this time they looked down on it with with derision this idea still is takes place today right we have you know even if we talk about something like film right we have what we think of as the art house films Right, oftentimes the more indie type films, you know, those aren't the films that you see at the Logan movie theater, right? Very, very rarely, you know. But then you have the, you know, the comic book movies and action movies, and stuff like that. That's that. Oftentimes, that sort of distinction, they look at those types of things as low literature. Right, you guys. I don't know if you guys saw this a while back, but this came up with uh, the director Martin Scorsese last year. You guys remember Martin Scorsese? He's directed a bunch of great movies, Goodfellas and The Departed. Um, he did The Gangs of New York. He made he's made a lot of good films, but he he actually, if you guys remember, last year it started a big shitstorm. Because he came out and said that the the Marvel comic movies were just trash, right? They're form they're formulaic. They always follow the same formula. He came out and said that's that's not real cinema, right? And of course that started a shit show with all the Marvel movie fans, right? How dare you say that? They're great films. So this idea of high literature versus low literature, the modern, we can thank the modernists for this because they had a very high opinion of themselves as actually coming up with good literature, not that low brows, high brow and low brow. That's the, that's the term. Their stuff's high brow. The other stuff's low brow. Oh, so before we talk about Elliot then, <clears throat> what do you guys make of this? This idea of literature, the idea that literature being tough to read and being inaccessible, like that makes the fact that it's challenging. That's what makes it good for good literature, right? We've read some challenging stuff in this class, right? We've read Hamlet, Paradise Lost, and all kinds of stuff. You guys necessarily agree that challenging makes for good literature? Or do you think that the modernists might have been a little uh, little too full of themselves here? Does a book have to be hard to read and challenging to be a good book?
even a movie, right? Should a movie be challenging to be a good movie? You know what my answer to this question is? I've already told you, right? What do some of the rest of you guys think? Looks like you got something. I mean, I think. What, Go ahead, Keegan. Sorry. I think what makes literature good or anything like that is completely subjective to your own opinion. And if you, you know, think something should be hard to read, then you should look for it. I think it's completely your own decision. All right, so if you want to read, uh, if you enjoy romance novels, for instance, right, you know, you might think that that's, that that's good literature. We talk, if we want to make a, if we want to paint examples of what we've painted before, right, think about something like Twilight as the definition of god-awful literature, right, the low, the lowest of the low brow, right, but for some people, for some people, that might be one of the 10 books they read in their entire lifetime, right? You know, so um, some people might think Twilight is good literature, right? Depending on what their perspective, just like what Keegan just said. So what, I guess the way into this question, what do we define as good? How would you guys define what makes literature good? or even art or movies. Let's come up with a list. Let's see, go back to my Word document. So give me a give me a term. What makes for good literature? I'll add complexity since that's what the modernists thought. But what else? What makes for a good a good book, a good novel, a good play, a good poem, a good film? Whether or not it makes you feel something. Okay. That's what Aristotle thought, right? That a, a, po a drama should have that sort of cathartic moment at the end, right? You should make you feel for the for the protagonist. What else? What else makes for a good piece of literature? What did, what did you guys, I'll, I'll ask Justin this, what was your biggest problem with the end of Madame Bovary, Justin? Uh, at the end, it looked, he abandoned his style and just honestly abandoned a lot of his characterization to try and make his point right at the end. Right. And his point was just something so ridiculously bleak. It, it, it honestly contradicted most of the rest of the tone. Like, sure, it's a, this is a tragedy. It's a personal tragedy. But then at the very end, you go on to say, oh, but of course, everything in the world is shit. So it honestly waters down the whole experience. Right. So how well does a text resolve the problems it poses? Does the text end, end well? Right. Everybody's got their own opinions about this. So should a book have a neat, a neat ending wrapped in a bow? Right, or should, or are more ambiguous endings better, right? Modernists, the modernists valued ambiguity, right? They did not want things to be clear, right? They wanted the, the reader to draw their own, to draw their own conclusions. 
some people like neat endings better, right? Which is, we've talked about this before. Some of you guys think that simplicity, a simplicity makes for better literature sometimes. A style that's easy to read and follow. We haven't read a lot of that, a lot of stuff like that in this class. Some of you guys think that sometimes the easy stuff, easier to read stuff can be deep too. We'll see Justin shaking his head, right? A lot of you guys liked yellow wallpaper last time because you said that it had a more easy, easy going style to it, right? Surely some more of you guys have other opinions, right? What makes for good literature? This is the chance to vent if you, uh, if you haven't uh, been a fan of some of the stuff we've read, right? So I'll ask this question. What pieces, what pieces of literature? Go ahead, go ahead. Um, I think like detail of allowing the person to like kind of either re, uh, relate to it or um, come up with the image of whatever it is in their head. Okay. So you're saying then that it should be relatable for different audiences and people. So I'll, I'll, I'll add the word universal here, right? Whenever we talk about the idea of the West of Western world literature, right? The, the word canon comes up, right? Why do we still read the Iliad um, 3000 years later? Well, the, I, the idea is well, what Kirsten just said, it's, it's still relatable for different audiences, even today, perhaps. Right. It, good literature is universal. It can speak to people in all times and all places. I don't know if, if, you want, if you wanted to take that idea that far, Kirsten, but that's a sort of what I extrapolated from what you just said. Yeah, the, the, the literary critic Howard Bloom Right, he just passed away last year. He was probably the most famous English professor in the United States. Lots of people either loved or hated the guy, but he's the one we owe it a lot to him for coming up with this idea that great uni literature is universal. Right? He thought that Hamlet was the greatest thing that has ever been written, right? Because he thought that ever, all of us could relate to Hamlet in some way hamlet's a character that will never not be universal to all people right well that's what he thought some of the rest of you guys might uh, might disagree he would come up with these ranking lists like shakespeare is better than milton milton is better than chaucer he would come up with a lot of this type of subjective opinions about what the greatest, most universal stuff ever was. What would you guys, what would you guys say is, was there any piece of literature you guys would say is complete trash, no matter how you, uh, no matter, it's it's definitely trash, right? Is there any types of books or media that you would say that is just completely 
we should just completely disregard it. Any of you guys have an opinion like that? Unhealthy relationships like that. You, you were muted there for a second, Justin. Say that again. Fifty Shades of Grey or anything that glamorizes unhealthy relationships. Okay. I guess how you spell glamorizes. Uh, something that glamorizes unhealthy relationships. Of course, you, you could make that case for a bunch of different romance novels, but like you guys talked about last time, romance novels have even grown and evolved with the times. What else? Is there any other types of media that you would just say is just completely uh, crap? I would say Twilight um, because she broke all her rules that she set in the first book, in like the first few chapters. Maybe books that are inconsistent. Whoops. I would I would make the argument here that sometimes literature that's very formula that follows a set formula can be uh, I would classify under this trash bin right. My best example for this is. TV shows on the CW. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm guilty of liking the shows on the CW, like Arrow and the Flash and all those types of Smallville and all those types of shows, right? But it's hard for me to deny that they're not trash, that they're not trash, right? Because they all follow the same sort of formula, right? You have somebody angsty in the show, you know, they're there was always some sort of love triangle in a, in a CW show, right? No matter no matter what show it is, it's or even something like uh, Supernatural, right? It's, it's, that's a CW show too. No matter what happens, it's going to always follow that formula. On a show like Supernatural, for instance, it's what it, what's the monster of the week, right? And they've made they made thirteen seasons all maybe more now off of what's what's the monster this week that so uh, that's that's just an opinion of mine right but something that follows this dead set formula i've always perceived as being a little little bit lesser <clears throat> wasn't the main villain for like three or four seasons of the flash like each season it was a new villain but Every time it was just some guy who secretly came back from the future to some end. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I eventually got to the point I couldn't stand to watch The Flash anymore because it got so angsty with the romance subplots and stuff. I just couldn't. I just couldn't take it anymore. And the, I've often times seen that mo that this argument about formulaic made with comic book films, right? They say, especially Marvel films, right? They all follow the same same formula. Think about a Marvel film besides uh, Thanos, right? There really hasn't been a villain that's maybe Loki. Right? Besides those two, a villains are always just kind of like thrown away at the end of a Marvel film, right? You don't never hear from them again. So lots of people say that those are formulaic. The Western is a formulaic genre, right? 
you know, uh, if you think about a West, the Western actually died as a genre around the 1960s, night, early 1970s. The Western was a genre that thrived on pa American patriotism, right? We're now, we're this great new nation, especially after World War II, we're this great new nation that's sort of the world leader. Let's romanticize our past, right? And romanticize the fact that we moved west into this frontier that we that needed to be tamed. So if you think about a Western, right, usually you have a cowboy who comes into the plot, he fixes whatever's going on, but then at the end of the of a Western, usually the cowboy has can't stay around. Like the cowboy has to ride off into the sunset because uh because civilization can't tame the cowboy right if that that's the formulaic way to end the western at least right i don't know how many old westerns you guys have watched the john wayne stuff and all that but that's often but that's the structure of those right some like usually a cowboy would come in whatever plot's happening and then at the end, the cowboy would just exit stage right. Life would come back to normal. But they, lots of people perceive Westerns as being this sort of formulaic genre. I actually disagree. I, mean, I think, I think West, Westerns have a lot of potential but uh, it's hard to deny that they're for pretty formulaic at the same time. I've went on about modernism for a while. We're probably not going to get every little point about T.S. Eliot today. We might pick it up a little, little more on Wednesday too, if we don't get into the specifics. What? What? Somebody want to check for me real quick? What's on the reading for Wednesday? Uh, we're doing Kafka's The Metamorphosis on Wednesday. Let's. What's the day that we're reading Bartleby the Scrivener? Uh, that's the next Wednesday. Let's flip those readings. Let's do Bartleby the Scrivener on this Wednesday. Okay. Because I think that'll be, I think that'll be a little more manageable. That way I can still talk about Elliot some on Wednesday if, if need be. Okay, so Bartleby, Bartleby this Wednesday coming. Metamorphosis will do Wednesday a week from now. I'll make an announcement. Just to, so now just to dive in a little bit about T.S. Eliot. Um, T.S. Eliot lived 1888 to 1965. He lived a very long life. His name is Thomas Stearns Eliot. You know, he's, he's a poet who's well-renowned both in the American literature and British literature. Now, if you guys, if you've taken the American literature since 1865 or Brit lit since 1800 class. He's, he's probably read in either one of those. Both countries claim, claim uh, Eliot as a poet in their canons. But he was born in America, but uh, after a while he went to, he, he got a Harvard education. You know, but after he got his education at Harvard, he moved to Europe and sort of became an expatriate. Right, that's what that's what the word expatriate is. Somebody who leaves the country moves to another. Of course, uh, in the in the twenties in Europe, there was a lot of these modernist poets, modernist writers did this. They would go to Europe. Oftentimes, they would they would go to Paris, 
like Paris as well. A lot of them like like to go to hang out because of course, of course they did, right? If you're if you're intellectual, you must go to Paris, Paris, right? But um, so Elliot sort of found his way there. Among, he made friends with a lot of other well-known writers, like Virginia Woolf, for instance. But his two great contributions to poetry, The Wasteland and The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, both of these poems sort of illuminate the stuff that we've been talking about so far, so far today. I'll go back to me. Now this idea of modernity, things are no longer the same. You know, literature is very fragmented. So maybe maybe today we let's let's spend some time today breaking down the uh let's talk about the wasteland today okay maybe we'll if need be we'll talk about proof rock on on wednesday so um you know i'll just i just want to get some general impressions here as far as your guys reading experiences with with the wasteland i gave you a a trigger warning of source last time saying that it's not the easiest read but uh what did you guys make in the wasteland did you appreciate Elliot's style did you appreciate what he was trying to do especially now that i've sort of given you an idea of what modernism is right did you find the poem or did you just think the poem made no sense you know maybe you started skimming over it after a, after a minute hot minute right this isn't making any sense i'm just gonna glaze over the rest of it be honest right what what was your uh what was your reading experience like with wasteland let's see shane how was your reading experience when i first read or go ahead, Rebecca, then I'll get the shame. All right. When I first read it, it was, it was very confusing. And right. then I had to get on Spark Notes to try to understand it. And that didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> Felt very, like, choppy to me. Because right. the way Spark Notes has it, it's separated in the sections. And some se sections were very much parted i think one was like about someone in like a higher class and then the rest of it was about two women in a lower class it felt very choppy in my opinion right the choppy i think is by design right just based off of what we've been talking about so far right he meant it he meant it to be choppy Shane, what did what did you make what did you make of the poem? Did you skim over it? Did you uh did you make some uh, sense of it? In terms of it being what they're trying to achieve during the modernism, they're definitely it's definitely complex. And uh I mean he's trying to uh um write uh in the way that they want to you know because they wanted to change right into what it was but still like you can tell i had the callbacks to the you know to the old writings that they had and and i think how it goes from just place to place and like in each and in, in each like a uh, section really makes it hard to understand but uh i guess that's what like i said i guess that's what they're going for i try to make out what the best i could out of it right so both both Shane and Rebecca have made comments so far that the structure, the structure of the poem is hard to make sense of, right? We have different subheadings. So we got the burial of the dead. Um, I do think the subheadings, they help a little bit, I guess, because, you know, I guess when it goes to a different one, you know, maybe it's changing 
from what it was doing before. It helps a little bit to a point, but still you have the reading part to follow. You got to try to understand that. Now we're going to, I guess, a little something different. You know, you got to try to keep on par with that. Right. So that might help with something like the tone, right? The tone might shift with uh, with the subheadings. I think that's especially true of the last one. Um, Oops, this, the fifth section, what the thunder said. We'll talk more about that in a second. Other, uh, Keegan, what did you make of, uh, of Elliot's, Elliot's work? Well, like everyone else thought, it was very confusing, but I was kind of used to it because I went through the same thing in art class a long time ago with the modernist era and the whole kind of like abstract ideas being compiled together and stuff. From reading it, it seemed to be a little bit downcast, which is understandable, I guess, because the whole mood of the modernist era was kind of like an upset in reaction to World War I. Um, overall, I really didn't care for it. I don't care about any, I don't care for anything for that era because I just don't like how downcast and sad it is. I mean, I perfectly understand why it's like that, but you know. Yeah, I, I agree, right? The poem is very gloomy, right? Almost, it's almost nihilistic, nihilistically gloomy, right? There's no, is there any hope for this civilization that the poem talks about? Right? Maybe, but it's, it is, it is very downbeat as far as, can you take anything good away from it? Any good vibes? You know, maybe, maybe not. I mean, yeah, the, if you guys want to look at some, break down some parts of the poem, of course the poem starts on 1154 of the text. If you want to, you want to break the, break your text open, 1154. The first stanza of the poem is very, uh, very famous. And you, this is how you pronounce it, by the way. You think it says the cruelest month, but but it, the way you pronounce it is very pompous. Okay, just, just so you guys know. So you, April is the cruelest month. Breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Summer surprised us, coming over this, I'm not even going to say that, with a shower of rain. We stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the Hof garden and drank coffee and talked for an hour. And then he gives us a little bit of uh, German here. And when we were children, staying at the Archduke's, my cousins took me out on a sled and I was frightened. He said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight. And down we went in the mountains. There you feel free. I read most, much of the night and go south in the winter. Here's, here's the part that's almost the key to, to what he's, he kind of lays out in this next section what he's doing. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of the stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. Only there is shadow under this red rock. Come in under the shadow of this red rock and I will show you something different from either your shadow at morning striding behind you or your shadow at evening rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Then we get another uh, verse from German. You gave me Heisings first a year ago. They called me the Heisings girl. Yet when we came back late from the Hyacinth Garden, your arms full and your hair wet, I could not speak and my eyes filled. I was neither living nor dead. 
and I knew nothing. Looking into the heart of light, the silence. Then the translation, barren and empty is the sea. So that's some great, that's some great imagery that he's given us here, right? But that, that line, a heap of broken images where the sun beats, and the dead tree that gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. It goes back to what Rebecca said a second ago, right? Elliot's project a lot, you know, is the sort of fragment. He even, he even says it here that this poem's a heap of broken images, right? That's not really, there's not really even connection. People can sometimes make connections, but these are just fragmented images that we're going to get throughout the poem of this sort of desolate, desolate place. The wasteland, yeah, the wasteland is the modern world, right? That's kind of what he's, that's kind of what he's going for here. This is our modern world after the, after the First World War. Okay. The world's changed. It's now, it's now just a heap of broken images. You get lots of good, lots of good parts of this poem. And it kind of direct, we, we get lots of different passages. And um, shortly after that, we get the description of the unreal city. We have section two is called a game of chess. And that refers back to an old Renaissance play called a game of chess. If you guys gathered from the, from the note, let's see. In the game, in the game of chess section, we get references to Iliad, Aeneid, and Paradise Lost within that one stanza alone. The word "nothing" is repeated a lot, right? This goes back to this idea of nihilism, right? The world is meaningless, right? Life is meaningless. That's pretty much what nihilism is. Right? Life's a joke. <clears throat> But the thing that I wanted to posit to you, <clears throat> you know, as we talked about almost the whole poem is very cynical, and pessimistic. When we get to this last part, what the thunder said, maybe we get a little bit of redemption for the modern world here. This is how I've always liked to read it. You guys might disagree. But the very last... Um, page of the poem you know he gives us these he goes to, and quotes some hindu scriptures from the upanishads which we read a little bit of the bhagavad gita earlier in the class but that that and the upanishads are the two sort of landmark texts of, of hinduism but the thunder at the end of the poem, the thunder is giving these sounds that go back to the sort of Hindu spiritualism. So I'll, just, I'll, I'll read from the top of, uh, from 1166 to the end. Ganga was sunken and the limp leaves waited for rain while the black clouds gathered far distant over Himavant. The jungle crouched, humped in silence, then spoke the thunder. Da, Dada, what have we given? My friend, blood shaking my heart, the awful daring of a moment's surrender, which an age of prudence can never retract by this and this only. We have existed, which is not to be found in our obituaries or in memories draped by the beneficent spider or under seals broken by the lean solicitor in our empty rooms. Da. Then Daya, I'm not going to even try to say it, pronounce that. I have heard the key turn in the door once and turn once only. We think of the key, each in his prison, thinking of the key, each confirms a prison only at nightfall. Ethereal rumors revive for a moment, a broken Coriolanus. Da, 
Damiata, the boat responded gaily to the hand expert with sail and oar. The sea was calm. Your heart would have responded gaily when invited, beating obedient to controlling hands. I sat upon the shore fishing with the arid plain behind me. Shall I at least set my lands in order? London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. Then he gives us uh, you know, some Italian that means then he too hid himself in the fire that makes those spirits ready to go higher. Oh, swallow, swallow. When shall I be as a swallow? These fragments that I've shored against my ruins, why then I'll fit you. Hieronimo's mad again. Dotta, Dayata bomb, Donyata, Shanti, 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 Shanti. And if you read the footnote at the bottom, that says that means a peace that passes understanding. So the narrator of the poem at the end does seem to come to some sort of of peace, inner spiritual peace, right? We get, then of course we have these Hindu, these Hindu words like da. If you look at the last page, it gives you a little bit of what these words mean. It says in the fable, the word da spoken by the supreme being is interpreted as dada to give alms. Dayadavam to sympathize or have compassion and Damyata to have self-control by gods, human beings, and demons respectively. The conclusion is that when the thunder booms, da, 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 the god is commanding that all the three virtues be practiced simultaneously. It's almost, it's almost at the end like the narrator comes to this sort of like spiritual apotheosis, right? What, how do we live in this modern world? Right. Well, we can take up some of these values, perhaps, like to sympathize or have to have self-control, to give alms. And that helps leads. That helps give you some sort of peace in this world that seems meaningless and lifeless. I don't know. What do you guys think of that? You guys think that uh, I'm full of shit here, right? Or do you think that this that this does add a little bit of uh, we talked about how the poem seems helpless. Like, does this add a little bit of hope, hopefulness to the ending that we can still come up with this sort of spiritual spirituality in this world? You said a second ago the world seemed helpless, Keegan. What do you make of this ending? I guess it gives a little bit of hope. I mean, I'd hope so. Right. I'd hate for everyone to think that everything's just a lost cause. But I don't know. I haven't lived through anything like that, so I couldn't imagine the mindset of the people living through it, so. Right. And you can even think of it even after the Second World War when the destruction was even higher, right? This is what, the Second World War, we had the atomic bomb, right? And that changed the whole way we think of the world, too. Of course, um, we can think we're pretty spoiled as Americans these days, right? But even think about like if you live somewhere where you're a little less fortunate, right? This whole poem of helplessness, nihilism, would probably speak to some of those places. Yeah, that's how I've always liked to think of the poem. I might not be right, but. It does get a little bit of redemption at the end. We can exist in this wasteland. But if nothing else, think about the wasteland as a poem that tries to encapsulate this era, right? This era of after the war, this broken European society, right? Nothing no longer makes sense. Everything is broken into fragments including the literature, the literature.
Is there any particular parts of this poem that you guys are interested in talking about? I talked about the beginning and the ending. There's lots of stuff in the middle. Any uh, anything that you want to try to make sense of within it? Well, something I might recommend that you do um, now that you have a little bit more of this context you know, after this lecture for the day, maybe just go back one more time. It'll take you 10 minutes to read the poem. Maybe go back now that you've got a little bit of this context. Maybe uh, see if you get something new out of it, right? It's kind of hard the first time without that context. What the hell is he making me read, right? Now that you guys now have, now have a little bit of this context in mind, I would encourage you to re-explore it a little bit, right? See, see if you can take any any meaning out of some of these fragments that he's giving us. Proof rock shorter, and proof rock actually makes a little bit more sense. So uh, review review proof rock again for. Uh, for Wednesday's class, if you would. We'll spend about 10 or 15 minutes talking about that. And then we'll talk about Bartleby the Scrivener. Okay. So uh, I think that's enough for today. Uh, like I said, today is a day where I figured I would talk more than usual. But hopefully that gave you some, some ideas. But like I said, maybe review it. Now that you got this idea, definitely review Proof Rock. Check out Bartleby. You guys are going to like Bartleby. It's a, I know you will. That story always stirs up good stuff. It's a story about a guy who pretty much who's part of this sort of labor, industrial labor, who says one day, you know what? I prefer not to do, do this anymore. And all kinds of all kinds of chaos from there. Right? So you guys, you guys will dig Bartleby, I think. So with that said, we'll call it. We'll see you guys uh, Wednesday. By the way, by the way, one more thing. At this point in the semester, I don't care anymore. So you don't have to worry about doing any more discussion board threads. Okay. Uh, I'm done. I'm done with that. Okay. So yeah, I trust that you guys are going to keep up with the reading and I'm not going to grade you on discussion board threads anymore the rest of the semester. One reason why I'm overwhelmed as it is. The re second reason I trust you guys to, to do the reading. Right. So don't worry about those anymore. Just one quick, one last little thing. So with that said, we will call up. See you guys next time.